Hazel is the founder and CTO of Chaos Sumo. I don't know how Chaos you Sumo. Chaos. Rest of the data, Chaos. Yeah. Has been at the forefront of communication, virtualization, and database science and technology. Um, prior of, uh, to founding Chaos Sumo, he was the founder and CTO of Deep Information Science Sciences, as well as as chief architect of uh, Akiban and Virtual Iron. So some of you may know Virtual Iron um, was the precursor of uh, uh, like Virtual Box. Yeah, we Oracle. were uh, we were doing first uh, Sugar West's over uh, Benavan, but then we saw that multi was coming out, so we ran to slice up the boxes versus uh, extending it. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember you were already using uh, uh, Amazon. We used Zen. Um, we actually had our own hypervisor when we were first doing yeah. Sugar West's, but uh, Zen was open source. So it was the kind of the place to go. So uh, we kind of made a professional version of it, yeah. um, sold that to Oracle. But you you were making use of Amazon somewhat because I, I remember one time I was just uh, downloading uh, documents and it was okay. yeah actually that's a that's a good intro to uh, obviously the word S three um, we we adopted uh, S three Amazon S three really early on at our company um, so. We can go into all that obvious towards this. Yeah, so we're done. Yeah, sure. Um, so, well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, Mass Bay. Thank you, Boston Networking User Group. Thanks, everything. Um, uh, so, I just had someone, um, I can't remember this gentleman, reach out to me, Mark reached out and said that I heard you guys are obvious storage folks. Um, there's a lot of questions around obvious storage, what it is, what it's all about. Um, and so, we are a company, KS Sumo, that is um, doing some new things within obvious storage, which this presentation is really focused on object storage, not necessarily KSUMO specifically, but we'll leave about 10 minutes just to talk about what we're doing at, at KSUMO. My name is Thomas Hazel, founder CTO at KSUMO. I have David Nablet, our chief architect and founder here. Um, I hear you guys ask a lot of questions, um, and I saw those couple of questions posed uh, on the meetup. You know, why is it not S1 and why was it S2 or, or was there S1 and S2 versions? It actually stands for Simple Storage Service and that's why it's S3. Oh. Um, so there was no previous versions, um, but uh, yeah, we'll get into it. Um, so the agenda is really, for those who are not familiar with object storage, uh, raise your hand if you know object storage um, a little bit well. Um, so we're going to go through the um, what it is all the way through, how to use it. Um, David's going to give a demo as well as, you know, really, you know, cover the whole gamut. Hopefully we have enough time. Um, we're going to do a presentation on Amazon specifically because that's one of the most well-known object storage services out there. It's in the cloud. And then we'll do a quick um, presentation um, on KS Sumo. I know you guys asked a lot of questions, so um, after the demo, let's uh, open it up to the, the audience. You know, our viewpoint is it's an object storage world. And why do we say that? Um, we at KSMO bet on object storage early, and it is growing and getting bigger. And the reason why I think you guys are talking about it and why you asked us to come here is it, something's happening. And you know, sure, there's, there's file systems, there's block stores, there's NAS, but there's something about object storage that I think is afoot. Um, so what is object storage? Uh, object storage really is a thought of abstracting away the hardware and really creating a service around that. Um, you can think of data that is stored, it's a place to store data as keys and values, unlike a file system or a block store. Uh, so don't think of it as a file system or a block store, although in a lot of these services you can make it look like a file system, which we get into, I think David will. Um, objects are really keys to value with some metadata tag associated with it. So if anyone's familiar with databases, um, relational databases, that's not this. Um, no, it's not NoSQL database, although some people could argue that it is a database like NoSQL, but it's really keys to values with metadata about the data. That's a key aspect to object storage. Um, the keys are globally unique. That's a key point. So for instance, in Amazon, when you create a bucket it has to be globally unique across all people in the world that use that service. There's some advantages and disadvantages to that, uh, but allows it to be a scalable architecture. Um, that's a whole other topic in and of itself. Um, in essence, there's simple constructs in object storage. You can put data in, you can get data out, and you can list the keys that are in there. 
it's pretty basic stuff. Sure, there's other APIs around that, but this is the basic construct. If you're familiar with relational database, which has a lot of functionality, um, this is why I think we, it took off. It's simple, it's elastic, and it's cheap. Um, but the data that you store by nature is opaque, meaning it's unstructured. So if you put structured data in, it in essence becomes unstructured. You have to know what, it's, what it is. Um, like a relational database, it has a particular type of structure. You're forced into it. This is unstructured. So the history is, out of Carnegie Mellon, um, they had this idea of object storage in 1996. Um, it, it kind of fostered a whole bunch of companies to build um, object storage um, products in the market. But a big thing happened in 2006. Amazon <laughs> launched their first service. Now, people think of Amazon, the cloud. They think of old compute and virtualization. S3 was their first service, not EC2. And what has happened since then, it's now Amazon's most popular service. They have two plus million people on it. And you talk to Amazon, they'll even say they were surprised how well it's been adopted. Now Google has one, Microsoft has one. Um, Amazon claimed several years ago trillions of objects. I'm sure it's way past that now. Uh, Microsoft wanted to one-up them. Well, we have you know 20 trillion objects. Um, but the forecast, IDC has forecast that by 2020, there will be 300 exabytes of data in object storage. That's a lot. Um, so you can see that there's, there's a trend here. You know, so the trends are S3 because Amazon has been so successful at this auto storage um, thinking, this philosophy, it's now become the de facto of API. Sure, there are variants in other products, but S3, Amazon, really, you know S3, you know a lot of what's going on. Um, widely adopted across all these industries. If you're not using auto storage today, some app you're using is using it. Um, it's, it's everywhere. Um, you know, I have some, some cool fun things here. 70% of the 100 supercomputers are using object storage. That means it can handle some big complex stuff. Um, you know, there's several examples of object storage uh, solutions storing 500 terabytes or more of data. So you can know that it can handle um, size. Dropbox was built on S3. Um, anyone use Dropbox? You know, a great service. Um, I don't know if Dropbox could have done it without S3 at the time when they started. Um, now our storage is the backbone of really every cloud provider. And if you look at what's happening in Amazon, um, it, you know, we were talking about data lakes, which we'll get into. It, there's something afoot on storing data and figuring out the data later. Um, but they will go into some use cases that you can use it. And again, cloud was the early adopters, but what we're seeing is in the enterprise, they're really pushing this technology. So if you haven't used it yet, it's coming to a theater near you very shortly in our opinion. Um, so, you know, the trends, I, mm -hmm. IDC, Forrester, Gartner, for, are all forecasting that everybody wants to store data to figure out insights later, right? we have heard it time and time again, big data, big data, big data. But where will that data be stored to figure out later? You've heard of Hadoop, I'm sure, right? HCFS. That has a good run. It's doing well. But you see this trend that maybe you should store it in object storage instead. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, you store an object storage, you take it out, put it into Hadoop, then put the results back in. Um, but really, the philosophy is everything is being stored to figure out later. And you know, just to bring up the concept of data lakes, if anyone, does anyone know what a data lake is? No. So a data lake, um, anyone know what a warehousing solution is, like RDS? So an RDS is classic enterprise where you have all these data sources that you wrangle to put into a big, you know, relational system to do any type of analytics on your company data. The problem with relational warehousing solutions is you have to structure it up front. The data lakes, you actually store it now and you structure it and figure it out later. So there's a whole movement afoot and um, IDC is projecting this to be a $10 billion business um, by the end of this decade. So with that said, this is about Amazon S3, so David's going to go into great, wonderful detail of S3 and what it can do and what it's all about, and at the end of the presentation, you'll give a demo, and then we'll talk a little bit about what KSM is doing within the object storage uh, S3 ecosystem. Thank you. Hi, so I'm David Donwood. I'm the chief architect and one of the founders at KSMO. Um, so the 
I think my goal here today is just to give you guys a, a bit of a flavor about what Amazon S3 is and what some of its its features are. I didn't see tons of hands when Tom asked uh, how many how many people are using S3 or familiar with it. So hopefully this is uh, this is well targeted. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Sorry. No problem. Um, so uh, you know we know we know that. S3 is is storage, and like uh, like many different storage solutions, you know we see a lot of these common uses, like you know backup, just just store it and, and archive it, either either you know local storage or other other cloud services um, would potentially use it as backup. Uh, S3 has all these all these nifty features for letting you do static website hosting, so you wouldn't even necessarily need your own hosting provider if you wanted to to do that. So again, it's a, a you know way to Serve, serve assets that you just have stored somewhere. Um, Tom mentioned data lakes. Uh, you know that that kind of put it put it somewhere, forget about it, and hopefully get some some value out of it later. Is another is another common use case. Um, you know, a lot of people end up putting Hadoop or, or other solutions like that on on top of it to to actually end up doing some some ETL and transforming it, maybe putting it in in a Redshift or or some other uh, some other. You know, relational database like that to, to actually um, pull out the bits that they that they care about. Um, one of the other things we, we see is is in the data collection space. I mean, you have a lot of IoT type use cases where you you have sensors streaming data, and you have a lot of a lot of volume coming in. You want to put it somewhere. S three is is pretty easily accessible over over the the REST interface. So you know these these things don't need to know how to to do very much to end up putting putting objects up in up in S3 for for later uh, analysis you know you see um, we we put this this market verticals uh, bullet here i mean we we talk to people and we see people using S3 across all sorts of spaces i mean you see it you see it in in banking uh, you know consumer consumer uh, consumer products energy healthcare people are storing like Health companies are storing patient patient records up there, and they they're they're worried about governance and, and things like that. Um, it's a big a big dumping ground, and uh, and so in terms of like the technical details, uh, cloud object storage and, and S3 in particular has has this sort of key value like semantics. It it has a it has a field that sits somewhere I don't know between. A, a true key value store and and something like a, a traditional POSIX file system. Um, it's uh, it's called S3 as Tom mentioned because because it's supposed to be simple. We'll, we'll see that they they've added quite a few features since they probably came up with their their simple uh, moniker. But um, it's really based on a few basic operations: put object, get object, delete object, and and list objects. And and some some variations around that. Uh, the whole the whole drive and architecture of, of cloud storage, as, as opposed to, to maybe something like a, a NAS, it's it's meant to be this serverless architecture. You're not managing any kind of uh, you know even physical or virtual assets. You don't have to provision S3. You just put objects up there. So there's no there's not not even a cap that you you sort of provision with it. You you want to store something there, you just you just issue a put object. Um, you know the again the whole thing is is kind of designed around the the philosophy to let the users focus on the what, not the how. So so unlike uh, POSIX, you know file system semantics where you, you potentially have to worry about locking down files or portions of files and you know. Starting to read a file and seeking to a particular location, all the all the operations on on S S three are designed to help you get directly to to what you want. It's like get an object or get get a range within an object. Uh, the um, the puts are are atomic, although they're eventually consistent. So if you if you're worried about uh, data consistency, you do have to sort of build it on on top of that outside the uh, outside the system. I, I will I will mention one interesting caveat. It may or may not be <laughs> or may or may not be interesting to you. They they do have stronger consistency for puts to new new objects provided you haven't tried to do a get object on that key before. Okay, that'll be in a test later. <laughs> um. so, uh, if I may, what? How does uh, containers uh, 
relate to that or do they? Containers like do like Docker containers yeah. or yeah. So I, I mean, certainly, certainly, Docker containers are you know used as the back end for a lot of these serverless um, implementations. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, S three Amazon doesn't tell you anything about how S three is implemented or what what the backing architecture is at all. And in fact, you don't really have to worry about it. Um, I think if I go, well, I have this I have this get example, but in in this in this slide. Um, I mentioned, you know, they will uh, balance the, um, they'll, they'll scale the architecture in the, in the back end depending on the, the load. So, you know, if you, if you put objects up there and, and you were using them to serve assets for your website, for, for example, and, uh, and there was, you know, you're, you're an e-commerce site and it's, uh, it's Black Friday, you don't have to worry about scaling that back end infrastructure to help serve all the requests. Amazon actually does this transparently for you. And uh, and maybe it's served with containers, maybe maybe it's not, uh, but you really don't have to worry worry about that. And so it fits in nicely with those those types of architectures because you can you know if you were building a service and and you know you want it to be backed by by Docker instances for for example, um, you don't have to then you know if you were spinning up a container you wouldn't have to then sort of similarly spin up anything for S3 to help you handle the the, the back end. So if you know if your containers were speaking to, to S3, there's no there's no additional provisioning there. But I skipped a slide, so I will I will go back. Um, so uh, I'll actually do I'll actually do a little example here. This may be a little bit hard to hard to read, but um, I have an example here. Is this better? How about you guys see this? Bigger? Yeah. Yeah, a lot bigger. A lot bigger. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay. Um, hopefully it'll it'll. So um, so I have I have a little I have a little example here that does that does a few uh, gets and puts. So um, S three Amazon actually uh, gives you this little command line utility, AWS utility, that's backed by, by this um, Python toolkit called Bodo3. But uh, this, is, this little command line utility lets you, lets you issue REST requests. Um, it's, uh, you'd like to just do curl or something. Uh, a lot of REST APIs let you, let you do this. Amazon has a kind of funky um, request signing mechanism, makes it, makes it hard to, to do uh, to do the signing with uh, with just with just curl, so a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of SDKs and, and such to help you access S3 easily. So this is this is one of them in any case, and uh, and so here I I have um, I have a few requests. This uh, this one I'm highlighting here uh, just does does a put object. I have a little a little file that I that I echo hello world to it uh, that. Put object request puts it up in S3 in a bucket that is called S3 crud example at key hello, um, and then subsequently I can go and do the get object request and pull that pull that back down and just and just echo it to the uh, to the command line and follow it up by by deleting it, and so I should be able to run the little shell script. So, this is uh, this is some metadata actually that we get we get back from from S3 telling us they, they call it an, an e tag but it's really really an MD5 sum of the uh, of the object that we that we put up there. It's kind of kind of useful because you can always sort of tell what uh, um, what's what's been put up when you uh, when you issue a put object. Um, then I uh, you can see our, our hello world here from the, the get object. You can even see uh, in the request it gave us back some some additional metadata, and you can see that these uh, match. <laughs> so it's what we it's what we put up, and then and then I and then I finally delete delete the object. So that that's uh, that's it for for putting up putting up data. There's not there's not uh, a whole lot to it. I didn't have to. Well, I I guess I provisioned the bucket, so I put a, a bucket up there. Buckets are are. Uh, kind of partitions for key spaces within S3, 
but uh, but beyond that, uh, the the keys are, are whatever uh, whatever I choose, and that's uh, that's really all you all you have to do. And the idea is to be simple. Um, if you're familiar with NoSQL database or relational databases, there's a lot to learn to use those those systems. Um, you know, put and get really is you know that simple. Anything else is, you know, Yeah, and you can levels. get, you can get, yeah. On the previous slide, you had, you know, the term CRUD, uh, GET, RES, <coughs> R-E-S-T. Yes. There are abbreviations for something. What, Represent. What do they mean? Yeah, rest well, so I can understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, the rest yeah. was capitalized. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so rest, it's like, it's like, like representative. Perfect. <coughs> Say that again, Eric. It's like representational state transfer. Is it a Something way like to that. communicate with a back end server? So it, it's a it's a philosophy for for doing HTTP requests. So what other what other kinds? There's REST and SOAP. So, so cer certainly certainly other other object uh, other. Uh, why, am I, why am I blanking? Yeah, certainly web other service. other web service protocols to uh, to use. Yeah, SOAP SOAP is SOAP is certainly one as as well. Um, yeah, the the guiding philosophy behind REST is is that you're you're not maintaining state um, on the server between requests. So the requests are kind of individual individual requests that do something and, and come back with a response. And one of our beliefs is with REST and the Angular service in the cloud is that when you add REST to a product, it seems to take off. And so because S3 and Object Store is REST based. Um, it's easy to use, easy to consume, and because of that rest is our belief why it's over. <laughs> and you're going to go into maybe to what CRUD is. I, I, I can. <laughs> uh, create, update, delete operations from, from our database background. If that, if that was a, a and so subsequent question. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> classic relational systems have a lot of complexity around those operations where put and get is much, much simpler. Can you use the skills that you learn in SQL towards uh, this you know, uh, storage? Um, may maybe a little bit. I, I mean, so so there's not you know C SQL has a lot of other features. So so you know you're you're doing things in the context of, of transactions, and that's keeping you from doing other certain certain operations. Each of these is is an atomic operation, but there's no there are no guarantees between operations, and in fact there's there's Nothing you can even use this. There, there are no features in S3 that will help you sort of build those locking structures directly either. Okay. And Although some people say, yes, we must build a database on, on uh, S3, but we're not. <laughs> um, um, so I touched on this uh, a little bit earlier, but uh, but S3 does does sort of help you scale the back end. It uh, it automatically replicates the, the data you put up. So if you if you put an object somewhere, you, you don't have to to go and then and then back it up in different places in S3. If you're if you're worried about data loss, they actually replicate it uh, behind the scenes. You are talking about replication within uh, <clears throat> and the S uh, Amazon S3 domain or, or regions. So there, there is there is a type of cross-region replication that they that they have as a feature as well. But what I'm talking about is is really just replication, sort of internally within a region to, to help you know keep basically help with high availability rate and uh, and prevent against data loss. So so when you put an object up there, it will actually get get put in a few different places physically. Um, so that if you know one physical server goes goes down, you you don't you don't actually lose anything. In fact, they can I have the bullet here. They can withstand the concurrent loss of uh, up to two facilities uh, with their their standard uh, replication when you when you do a put object. Um, so when I when I mentioned that that S S three maybe shouldn't shouldn't be called simple anymore, it's it's when you start to, to get into some of these additional features that they that they have. So beyond the the puts and gets and, and lists, you you actually have a, a bucket versioning feature. 
So uh, you can turn this on, and then any any puts that you uh, that you um, mm. upload to your to your bucket uh, will automatically get versioned, and uh, and they'll maintain the entire history of, of everything that you put up there. Um, they have a, a very rich uh, feature set with respect to, to their metadata, so they, they let you uh, you know tag buckets and objects with with you know arbitrary keys, so you can instead of Instead of having this sort of uh, very restrictive organizational scheme with like a, a POSIX file system where you're you're kind of relegated to to you know putting this you know imposing this very specific directory structure on on your data and then kind of using that to help help organize things you know it's it's really intended to be something where you you tag objects or you or you put Put little bits of, of uh, data in the keys themselves to help you to help you find objects, and um, the the S3 uh, user interface actually presents the storage as something like a traditional file system that you, you might be familiar with. So if you put slash it forward slashes in your in your keys, the S3 API will kind of let you let you walk them as if it were a file system, but from the S3 backend. They really, they really don't think of it that way. It's just a key. It's just, it's just actually a, a, a blob of data. And then in a list object, they let you slice up that key based on a delimiter. If you want, you could, you could uh, slice it up by slashes, or you could slice it up by, you know, the letter A if you, if you want. So you can, you can kind of play games there with the, with the keys. And, and the, the list object feature actually lets you. Um, Treat treat S three a little bit like a database. <laughs> um, so I have another another uh, example here of the of the list objects, and I'll talk about. Oops, sorry. Can I have a question before you? Sure. Example. Yep. You say that every time you do a pull, uh, the data is replicated behind the scenes. Yes. How is dealing with consistencies? Could be cases where you have inconsistencies. Absolutely, and in fact, Amazon gives you a, a very weak consistency model. It, it, all, all the, uh, all the um, objects are eventually consistent, and so you may indeed get, uh, you may do a put object in one in one place, and you may you may get a different version of the object if you're reading from a different a different location. If you if you have consistency concerns, well, so um, so there are two two things. One is is puts are atomic, so you and you can't like update part of an object. Um, so you know that any object you get is a fully consistent object at some point in time. Um, but but yeah, if you need if you need consistency beyond that sort of eventual consistency model, you do need to build it outside of S three. That's where relational databases are going to still around, right? <laughs> yep, yep. And in fact, um, in fact, Netflix um, uses S3 as, as the backing store for a lot of a lot of their uh, service. But they um, they actually also write the directory listing to Dynamo, um, which is a Amazon's key value store, to provide stronger consistency for the for the listings. And uh, and then they and then they can like match some of the some of the metadata so they know when when the object is actually um, you know finally arrived in the <laughs> in the right spot. Um, does that answer your question? So so I have another example here. Um, this one I've uh, I've pre-staged a, a file with um, a few. Uh, a few different interestingly formatted keys that have some dates uh, that are built with slashes separated by by a dash, and uh, and this first this first one I just do I just do a, a listing of the entire bucket so you can see the keys in their in their entirety, um, but then in these subsequent uh, listings I actually first split by this dash delimiter, and secondly. Um, do a query where I only get some subset of those keys, the ones that match this given prefix, and then also uh, split by dash. So you'll see in a second why that's significant.
So here's the here's the whole the whole listing. We have keys like this. It's just two two dates separated by separated by a dash. And maybe you know maybe this was uh, you're you're trying to to put put some data up that uh, was was relevant to that particular <coughs> date range. Um, so if we if we separate by by dash, we should we should actually end up seeing just the first. Uh, Unique sections; those first, those first dates. So we can we can sort of do a query by start date, simply by having formatted our key in a particular way, and then and then splitting on dash instead of slash. So we, we notice that that there are a couple um, a couple dates there in that 2017-03. So if we wanted to drill down, this query actually says, okay, only. Only look for keys that start with that 2703, and then split by slash. So that lets us go and then look at those um, those two particular dates. It's kind of an interesting um, interesting use of the of the list object API, but it shows you that that some of these um, features, while conceptually simple. Have a bit of a bit of depth to them. Um, on top of that, how can you have a, a conversation about storage without talking about security and, and access control? So Amazon is actually very 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 good at this. They provide very fine grained access control with uh, with these so called bucket policies. So on any on any bucket, you can attach this policy document, and I'll show you an example of this in in a little bit uh, for a particular. Uh, for a particular use case, but it lets you it lets you restrict op operations based on either who's using it or 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 just the uh, the particular operation. Um, they also provide a, a really nice mechanism for cross account access. So when I was showing you the those buckets in the previous examples, those are just my buckets, and if you went to S3 and you tried to list it, you wouldn't be able to see those buckets at all. And if you even if you Put in that bucket, you wouldn't be able to, to get access to it. Um, the way Amazon handles this cross-account access is through something they call IAM rules. Um, if you if you're not uh, if you haven't lived it a little bit, they're a bit confusing. But you can sort of think of them as as a husk of a user inside your system. So you you provision this shell of a user it has no credentials, but you can attach access rights to it, and then you can delegate a trust relationship for that particular role to a different account, and then that account is allowed to assume a role. So they'll log in through their credentials, and then they have the permission to assume that role. That kind of brings them into your space, and, and whatever that role has permission to do, uh, like, for example, access your, your S3 buckets, you could, uh, you could achieve this sort of cross-account access in that way. Um, S3 also has... Uh, uh, does a pretty good job of, of encrypting uh, data both in flight uh, using HTTPS and uh, at rest uh, through their server-side encryption. They have uh, two two mechanisms for that as well. One is they have a, a managed key service, which is which is kind of nice because um, so you can provision a key up in S3. You don't literally have access to the key, just an identifier. <laughs> And then they let you use that whole access control mechanism that I talked about before to delegate which users or roles have access to that particular key. So it lets you sort of encrypt things uh, at, at rest on the on the server side, and then and then give give those specific um, users or roles uh, access to that. Um, they also have the second mechanism, which is literally you provide a, a, a key and you can share the key however you want, and those are. Um, you pass those in literally through the, the individual requests. Um, another nifty feature is this thing they they uh, they call pre-signed requests. So I mentioned mentioned before, you know, it's hard to just do a, a curl on on an S3 object, but um, and that's because of the, the signing mechanism. But they actually let you uh, pre-sign a request if you choose and provide. So you, you basically end up generating this, this signing token that you can attach to a, a particular HTTP request. And, uh, and when you generate that token, you can even give it uh, like an end time for, for how long that's valid. And so then you can share that. So let's say you wanted, you wanted 
your friend to be able to upload a, a video to to your S3 account, but only only over the next day or so, you could actually end up giving giving you know pre-signing a, a request for him, give him the URL with that signing token, and then uh, and then let him do that upload, and otherwise not have to even provision any account for him or or go through any any other sort of complicated. Um, I am role setup or anything, anything like that. So, so they have a lot of a lot of nifty mechanisms for for facilitating sharing, but not not kind of going o overboard. Still keeping it relatively easy. Um, and I mentioned I put this bullet as as the last uh, bit here because um, since they do let you uh, serve static uh, HTTP content or static web content over. Um, over S3 buckets, they do let you adjust the, the core settings if that happens to be something that you need for your uh, scripting that you might use. So is that a mechanism that you use for um, to implement disaster recovery? So uh, putting up uh, data or, or replicating data on a local site to S3 and, uh, and implementing security uh, replication, whatever. So, sorry, is the is the question? Could you use S three as sort of a, a backup to help mitigate, you know, uh, uh, disasters for some local system you have? Uh, well, pretty much, can you use it uh, for disaster recovery? I would say so, provided that you you're not worried about some of these potential consistency issues. So, so it depends, you know, if you have very, if whatever you're trying to back up has, has very specific consistency requirements, then S3 might not be your solution unless you also use something in conjunction with it to help you kind of pick up the pieces after the fact, if that makes sense. Um, and some people, actually some, a lot of people do use backup, um, uh, S3 as, as a backup system, um, but if you know what you're doing, you can do it quite, um, well, but there's not uh, there's not a feature out of S3 that does that. However, there's a lot of companies around Amazon that are doing just this. So, like like I asked, said before, you may not be using S3 directly, but someone else is using S3 to provide the services that you have or use. So, it would be better, I think, for a, an archiving system that doesn't change all that much, as opposed to a very dynamic system that does backup? No, that's, that's a really good question. Um, originally, object storage was seen as a place to store data backup, but there's these trends, these data lake trends of storing IoT, real-time data, within this this framework, which um, this is where you know companies like KSUMO get involved. Uh, but there's a lot of services around Amazon that help you do that real-time um, processing and storage in S3. So it, there's a trend to use it as, as a real-time um, backup store. So why is it um, using it for IoT versus backup is it more efficient? Well, as, as Dave was mentioning, um, it is extremely cheap and it's wonderfully elastic and easy to use. A lot, a lot of other services um, can do some things better, but might be more costly. Uh, cost prohibitive, or you have to provision it. So it's not saying that it's it's the perfect solution for all things, but there's a lot of trends. We actually have a customer that is using object storage as their real-time um, backing store to all their devices that they have, IoT devices, into S3. Well, that's kind of to follow, to follow on. In my experience, okay, it's simple, it's elastic, it's cheap. Okay, great. Well, that means there's drawbacks. It means there's a lot of stuff that it can't do. So I'm just wondering what the specific, and we're talking about what it can do, what are, what, what are, what are the weaknesses, what are the use cases that it can do, where it's like, oh, I wish I could use S3 because it's so cheap and easy and simple, but damn it, I can't. No, you're doing our product pitch, that's what Keo Simo, the last few slides will say, S3 is great, but X, Y, Z. So let me hold that thought and then we'll get into uh, those slides. No, it's, it's a, it's great. Those slides are coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's certainly yeah, there's certainly that aspect. Aside from what you might you might cover, I would say probably its biggest weakness is is in its consistency guarantees and having to kind of go out, outside that. You know, for an IoT case, it's actually pretty pretty good because you tend to be writing a lot of new files, and if you put it up there, it will it will get there. I guess you have improvements on the IoT use case as well. 
Certainly, <laughs> certainly but, but. And that's why there's a lot of companies that are around this to help you facilitate that. There are some limits in performance that comes with it, so. Um, but for example, like if you had wanted to to like run MySQL on top of S3, I would I would worry about the consistency guarantees between mm -hmm. files. So, there's a company so there called. Yeah, sorry. I was okay. going to say that certain databases like uh, Impala, Cutter and Impala now support fully support S3, so they have an S3 guard, so they're checking to make sure that replication consistency works in time. But, but it has to be built in. Does that impact the performance of the database? It does. Yep. Like, hey, yep. like, I don't get the performance because right. it's because you're still limited with the store. Exactly. The technology from the store. Yeah, so we use we use both. We build Hadoop data lakes on on S3 um, and, and on so for uh, Azure and on disk. So for Hadoop, it's not more than that. Well, it depends. So you, then we run workload tests, and, and the reality is, depending on what you're doing, it may be adequate. If the cost is much better, the, the scalability is much better, and in some cases, the performance doesn't impact you. But we give customers both options. Okay, so more so cost to, to, by performance, but the, that performance. Yeah, the, the there's a oh, there's a popular, uh, not relatively popular, um, analytic database called Snowflake that's doing quite well, and they're, all their storage is on S3. Um, clearly they do all that consistency in their layer, but they're based on this concept that S3 is elastic, it's cheap, um, you know, it, it's really core because data is getting bigger, you know, and, and adds costs and uh, complexity. Thank you. How is this compared when you, when you go to, you know, something like, like LDAP in which I like a database in which you, is good for reading but not for writing, is this, better for writing or with writes or is just or is I, I mean I mean it's it's good I mean it's good for both reads and and writes um, but again it's uh, the fact the fact that it it scales well they sacrifice on on consistency like a lot of the no single big data plays they eventually just see has one out because it's easy to scale right <clears throat> File size makes an object size makes a big difference too. I know the Duke wants big, big files right. and, uh, and, and makes multiple block copies that works well. If you start putting small blocks on it, the performance goes mm -hmm. way down. Right. Yeah. And I've even I've even heard how you partition your key space can can matter in terms of in terms of the keys. They have a particular hashing mechanism they, they use that ends up if you if you do it one way, you end up kind of funneling your your. Uh, Data toward one replica versus another internally until it gets until it gets replicated. Um, so, if that's uh, good, I'll show you the sample uh, bucket policy here. Are you sure you heard the news where S3, all this data went public and uh, all these security things. So it's not S3's fault that that's happening. It's the IT admin or the people who, who misconfigured S3. So if you Google S3 and, oh, 100 million people were left unopened, um, it's a misconfiguration. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. Equifax? Yeah. Are yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. talking about Equifax? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if Equifax are using S3, but I know that a lot of other services that even Google S3 and security, that'll come up. I'm just curious, I'm curious though, is that a moment? Is that a weakness, is, is, is a security or lack thereof a weakness when compared to the other tech Actually, Equifax, technologies? Actually, Equifax technologies are not. No, I, mean, I would I mean, say, yeah, I would say Amazon does a very good job yeah. with security, but you have to know, like anything, you have to know what you're doing and configure it properly. I um, mean, actually, Equifax failure was not a, a thing. Right. Somebody, yeah. come, somebody yeah. come to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of their admins didn't patch the, the exploit. Right, right. <laughs> awesome. So in this, in this example here, I've gone to the, actually, maybe I'll, maybe I'll back up uh, for a minute. Um, so this is this is the the Amazon S3 uh, web web UI. So we're we're signed in and we're we're pointed at, at S3 here. Um, for this particular account, I only have these these three uh, these three buckets. But um, if we go to to one, this one's empty, so you don't see anything in it directly. But we can go to the permissions tab and click on bucket policy. I have one in my paste buffer, so I'll just paste it in. <laughs> um, but what this uh, is this big enough? I can make this bigger too. Um, in this this particular bucket policy, it says uh, deny anyone 
uh, delete bucket access on this bnug demo bucket. <clears throat> so if I save this and go back to this, whoops. all about the inverted scroll when you have the. Um, so if we click on this, and it's going to be in my way, uh, delete bucket, it's not built for uh, this resolution. So I'm going to try to... <laughs> So it's still it's still there. <laughs> and that's some of the complaints about S three that it is very textual to configure these policies. Um, yeah, it's it's um, so there are all sorts of things, all sorts of nifty things you can you can put in here and add multiple multiple statements and match on like you know you have like, like these wildcard matches on on UIDs and, and things things like that. I mean you can you can really uh, you can really go to town in uh, in this, but uh, but yeah, I, I mean, if if there's something you want to lock down, I think Amazon gives you a, a knob or dial to to do it. And on top of all of this, you you tend to want to to attach your storage to something to something useful or to, to take a take a look at what's what's happening with it um, and so Amazon provides a, a few features in in this space in in particular they they let you um, uh, get object creation and, and deletion notifications either via their um, SNS SQS or, or lambda services um, and and you can you know obviously have have those connected sorry have those um, Connected uh, to to whatever application you might be you might be building, um, on a per bucket basis, they let you turn on logging, uh, so you can get kind of an, an access log of, of who's who's uh, done what with your with your bucket. Um, they also have their explicit cloud CloudWatch and CloudTrail monitoring services. Uh, I put this I put this here too. Maybe it doesn't quite fit under monitoring and event notification, but I, I thought I'd, I'd mention it. Um, they have this object lifecycle management feature too, which is which is very nice. So, uh, especially if you have that that versioning feature turned on, where you're storing all sorts of all sorts of different versions of, of data that you've put up. Maybe you haven't accessed them for a while, so they they let you configure uh, ob objects in in these buckets um, to adhere to this object lifecycle, where they'll either be deleted if they're not used or archived to Glacier. Uh, which is their sort of cold storage, uh, super, super, super cheap. Um, they also have uh, different uh, replication levels. So I mentioned that you know your objects are replicated in in S3's backend. Um, if uh, if you don't care about having your object as replicated as available, and you're you're willing to accept uh, you know potentially worse worse performance or or higher mm -hmm. risk of loss of data. Um, you can you can turn on this so-called um, infrequent access uh, replication mode for for your object, and that will be a little bit cheaper. So you have all these all these options to kind of either either move you know delete delete your objects entirely if if they're not being used or according to to some some particular policy, or uh, or again archive them to something even even cheaper than S3, even though S3 is pretty pretty good. Um, I think this is probably about it. Yeah, so finally, um, I have a slide here about uh, mm -hmm. talking about migrating data to object storage. Um, so if you if you have a, a lot of data, they, uh, they actually let you upload objects a little bit faster through this bucket transfer acceleration. So if you had some, some big objects that you wanted to put up, normally they're, they're you know, uh, only, only surfaced so, uh, um, they're only provisioned so much bandwidth, so they, they let you turn on this accelerator mode to let you get a little bit uh, bigger bigger pipe up to S3 if you want to put some of these large objects. Uh, 
probably I, I'm not sure I've, I've heard of anyone actually using this feature, but they they actually let you they actually let you uh, get BitTorrent access to your uh, to your S3 S3 object. So if you put an object up and you wanna you wanna get it uh, you wanna get it down fast, you can actually uh, S3 can serve as a, a BitTorrent tracker, and you can let the let the BitTorrent network kind of offload some of this uh, for you. Um, they also have uh, a couple of a couple of mechanisms for loading data locally and then literally shipping it to Amazon through their Snowball Snowmobile uh, features, and um, and also this uh, they have this uh, hardware AWS storage gateway that lets you have this on-prem device that that has a higher uplink in for like remote locations and things things like this. Um, Finally, you've got you've got some data services like Kinesis for the for the streaming we mentioned, and then you have a, a bunch of different integrations like Redshift and Elasticsearch, which can which can talk to S3 directly. Actually, a funny note about the Snowball service: it's an 18 wheeler that goes to your company, and it's a big backup system that you back up and then drive it to Amazon's uh, data center. So it's seriously, yeah, yeah. And it, and it, it yeah. Just, it's, wait, wait, that's wait, wait, wait. crazy. It's, it's not April Fool's Day. I, 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 cool I, I thought it was when I first saw it. <laughs> oh, um, serious, I, I missed that first. <laughs> and I invited so the back part. They woke you up. They have these big eighteen wheelers that are, you know, uh, S three clouds that they, they drive to your uh, um, location, and because the, the pipes are so um, expensive to move that type of data, they, they have direct pipes put in the truck, and then they then they back it up. It's just facility. because of the envoy? Yeah, if you yeah. literally have a truckload of data, they give you a truck to load I can't remember how big it is, but it's, I don't know how many petabytes is it? It's, it's a lot of petabytes, it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's big. I don't yeah. expect anyone in here to, so it's to like be using it. literally a mobile clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then, to then drive when, 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 when uh, Skynet takes over, yeah. all clouds will be on the highway, moving around, make sure they don't, uh, yeah. But more, more practical is they, they send you this, this snowball, I think it's the canister, so snowmobile is the tractor yeah. 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 So, so <laughs> snowball is they ship you a prepackaged um, machine yeah, 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 that's with right. uh, how, how many terabytes? Uh, it, it's it's, a it's also big. A lot of terabytes. <laughs> so and you plug it into your data center and it has a tracking, it has a Kindle for tracking, and and it, and then when you so you follow the instructions as an agent, it, it loads it up, you send it on its way. Yeah. Um, so it's, and it, and then it'll fill your buckets. So instead of sneaker net, it's tire net. Yeah, tire, yeah. tire net, tire net. Yeah, yeah. 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 pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, it's nifty. So do they run a big cable from your data center to, to the truck through the out the front door? That, I, I, I guess I'm sure people have thought about this. They've talked to them. I think if you're committed to that, I don't know how much it costs, but I'm sure. I was just actually wondering how. Yeah, um, yeah, but I'm sure it's it's. Five, they probably have a lot of cables. Yeah. 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 Like the uh, per owner of the data or per user or yeah, per so some it's, kind of configuration. Yeah, or so like so a bucket is kind of is kind of a, a unique key space for you to, to manage your, your objects within. So um, anything if you had a key hello in bucket A, it doesn't conflict with you know hello in bucket B. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, in S3, buckets are uh, globally scoped. So the bucket namespace is is global, global, and that's because they use DNS. So they'll literally give you a, a DNS host, uh, like you know, bucket name dot Amazon AWS dot dot com, um, and so those obviously have to be unique because you can't have two of two of the same. So lock down like host. IBM. Microsoft, like on all those buckets and see if I like, can. Uh, yeah, see if you get a phone call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but yeah, they are they are you they are uh, those are globally unique. But but again, then you provision a, a bucket and then you kind of have your own key space within that in that bucket. That's whatever whatever you want to to uh, to put in there. Uh, they only give you a hundred by default too. Again, probably because of the domain names are, are something of a scarce resource. But these are things you can call them up if you are going bigger. You can call them up and. Uh, Use that bucket size or use KSMO. Um, you know, but anyway. <laughs> cool. Um, so I do have one more little little demo. Um, the the idea is to is to kind of show you something that uh, that you can build without uh, without too much too much work. I guess it depends on your 
your definition of too much work, but um, the idea the idea here is to build sort of a, a like an Apple time machine type feature on a on a bucket using using S3, and so on the bucket we can uh, go back to console. So I'm going to use this BNUG demo bucket, and if we go to properties, we can see that I have versioning enabled for, for this bucket. So that means that, that any object I put up there will be stored. So even if even if a key name uh, is is uh, you know a conflict, it'll keep the it'll keep the old version. A normal list will only show that that sort of uh, final uh, snapshot of what what's up there. But uh, it uh, they have a, like a list list object versions API that lets you sort of look at every object that's that's ever been put up there. And uh, and get like a version ID that you could use to get that specific version of of an object. Um, so I have I have a script. It's gonna let's see. It's probably a little a little bit much to digest, especially in this tiny this tiny window. But what I'll do is. I'll kind of show you in here that it's really just based on a few simple uh, S3 operations. Actually, most of this script is just is just kind of parsing the the data I get back from S3 to allow me to make decisions as to as to what to do. But um, but the script basically will will take a a bucket as a parameter. It will take a local directory on your file system as a as a parameter. And you can choose to sync in one direction or the other, and then I also have a little compare uh, script to show you what the differences are, uh, in case you just wanted to see what uh, what might happen if you were to sync in one in one direction or, or the other. Um, in in here though, you can see that we we call this list object versions API. This is very similar to the list object API that I, I showed you in the in the previous example, um, and in this case we really just Dump the entire the entire bucket, so it just it'll just spit back every version of every object I've ever I've ever put up there, and you'll have some some corresponding metadata. In fact, I can even even show you that. Uh, I guess I should put something up there first. Um, only be one thing up there now. <coughs> I did my job right. So so there there it is. Uh, key hello size twelve, which we all know is hello world. <laughs> um, and uh, and some some additional metadata. So in particular, they show you like uh, a last modified date. Um, they give you this version ID, which is something I mentioned before. This lets you literally uh, ask for that particular version of of the object. Um, and then some, you can see some other stuff like the standard storage class. So that has the standard replication. Um, <coughs> It's the owner owner ID, and it does happen to be the, the latest object. I have a question. I have a question. So let's say um, you have versioning on, and the MD5 is the same hash. Um, will there be two versions, or which do you want? Um, I actually don't know. I suspect there will be two versions. Um, my script purposely avoids that scenario, so <laughs> we won't we won't see it in the in the demo. Um, yeah, in fact, I I had done that uh, that upload, and uh, it doesn't think there's any anything anything different as we can see here. Um, the the MD5 of that the uh, the hello file in the local directory actually is the same as the MD5 in that uh, BNUG demo, uh, and so subsequently I I actually 
say there's nothing different in it and, uh, and would avoid uploading it entirely. Um, but if we look at the S3 API some more, so otherwise, uh, when I'm uploading to S3, it's you know it's just a it's just a put object, nothing nothing special at all there. In fact, uh, I turned on versioning on the bucket itself, so I don't even need to say upload a versioned object. I just I just put it directly. Um, if I want to remove it from S3, it's a it's a delete object again. Uh, I don't I don't really need to mark that it's a, a version one. It'll uh, it'll actually just sort of mask it with a delete marker uh, internally. The get object is the only place where I have um, I have one different uh, one difference from like the other get object example I showed you guys earlier, and that's that I allow it allows you to specify the the version ID. So in the case that we're trying to retrieve from a snapshot, I'm actually going to look at all the the objects uh, through that list object versions. Uh, I'm going to try to try to find the the latest version that's less than some particular last modified date. Um, at that point, I'll grab the versions and I'll do I'll do get objects on the the individual ones given the the specific version identifier. So instead of necessarily getting the latest one, it will try to get that latest snapshot one. And let's see. And that's and that's actually it for the S three commands I use, so four. So as we saw before, I in that local data directory I have one one file. It's just hello world. I could update it. Just say Goodbye instead. <clears throat> so now I can run the little compare script and it should show that the one thing has changed. So it's uh, it's going from uh, actually from, from this to this one. So if I upload it. We see we see goodbye there. Um, and so I should be able to get the previous snapshot. So if I run the script, uh, so this should show one difference with the other snapshot. And if I do a get on it, oh, that was gone entirely. The clock was a little bit off. Another minute. We get our hello world back. So. <laughs> So that's about that's it, object and that's object storage. So that's about it for for my uh, my part of the presentation. If you guys have more questions, you're welcome to, to ask them. Where did you get the name Chaos Sigma? <laughs> so uh, so uh, as as uh, as you might tell, I love building startups, building technology, selling them. Um, so I had an idea of building this company called Chaos Sigma around some technology that I invented several years ago. Um, and Chaos Sumo was one, I could find it, I get the domains, I get the Twitter, the, I mean, all that stuff, but really it's, it's around rest of the data chaos that is happening in the world, particularly on object storage. And so I thought it was a fun, clever name, and uh, it seemed to stick, and again, I would get the domain. It has, has the initial CS, too. And also has the initial CS, you know, well, your science, science people, there, so. you know, so, uh, um, it's, it's a fun name and it gets people's attention and it says what we do with rest of the data chaos. Any other questions? So, so there's no other questions. Um, I'm going to do a quick company pitch if that's okay. A um, few minutes. Um, thanks, David. I, I have a little question. Sure. Um, does the object storage relate in any way 
with object programming? It does not. So, so I, I come from uh, building object-oriented databases. Like I mentioned, I sold a database at Oracle that was an object-oriented database. When I first heard of object store, storage in 1996, I'm like, what was that? Is object-oriented database? Is it object store in something else? So um, it's not related, although the construct of an object, of a value, is similar, but there's no methods. There's no um, you know, object data with method behavior. There's none of that. Um, so it's kind of confusing for people who grew up, you know, did a lot of object-oriented programming in the 90s and, and, and object databases, but, you know, I don't know if you have Doesn't, doesn't uh, Microsoft call theirs blob store? And Microsoft calls it blob store. I think they call their buckets containers. Yeah, if, you. Know, you know, so, so there, there's a little variance here and there, um, but to me, when I first heard it, I was actually confused as well. Um, any other questions? Is this use also, can be used for uh, high performance computing or is it just for really? For so what, what I've seen, what I've read is that a lot of the supercomputers use it to store um, a lot of their data. Um, but again, is it a high performance? No. no. Um, but it's a great way to store lots of data. Um, and because it's an unstructured format, you can store anything. That's also its problem too, right? Um, that's why we talk about warehouses and data lakes. The trend to data lakes, and I'll get to that a little bit, is that today your data isn't nicely structured anymore. You know, do you put videos in a warehouse? Not really. But you would put videos um, into other stores, like they mentioned Netflix. And so that's kind of the where the world's going and all that semi-structure on structure, it fits quite nicely into auto storage and you know structure data fits quite nicely into it, although you don't know what the structure is unless you know what it is from some other um, service out there or KSM. The system likes large files. That's right. I mean, I, it can be large files, it can be uh, um, small files. It l really allows you to do any flavor in those constructs of put, get, list, and then as David showed you, delete. If you don't use uh, object storage on the on the cloud on S3, uh, what is an example that you have of how to use it on uh, on premise, uh, NAS boxes, or distributed file system? What, so, what is the so I am familiar with OpenStack, you know, and Swift. I mean, there are, you can build your own object storage service, um, but it's a heavy lift. You need to have experts in this. Uh, this, this technology to build that out. But like you say, you're building your own cloud. Um, and it's it's a whole nother topic to build an object service in-house. Um, it, it can be done, people do it today. Um, it's just that the great thing about cloud services and Amazon is all that hardware provision that's happening underneath the hood is done for you. It's elastic from your perspective. How about hybrid cloud? Um, hybrid cloud, I mean, you know, there are companies out there that, um, whether it's, it doesn't have to be auto storage on-prem, but there's a lot of companies out there that are trying to build service around taking your on-prem data and synchronizing it with the cloud. Um, we're not part of that story, uh, but um, there are a lot of companies out there. If you Google, you know, you know, hybrid services or hybrid cloud, you know, you'll find a variety of solutions out there. Yeah, you may, again, maybe you commented but the metadata, what, what, is, uh, what kind of information is... Yeah, so that's, so that's very interesting. One of the reasons people love object storage and think it's a game changer is this metadata, these attributes about your data. So the idea is that you have your key, which is kind of like your unique identifier that we talked about, your object, anything, and then attributes on that data that you can specify yourself. So you can say, um, here's a video. Now, I don't know what's in the video per se, but I can add metadata tags on that to describe this is my kid's you know, sixth grade birthday um, that took place in so and so. And I can um, search those meta tags based on the constructs of object storage. So, and some things that we're doing in our own service is um, bringing those meta tags to life in our service to help you search. Um, so, that's, that's why people think uh, object storage is so unique, is that meta data around your data that you can drive. So that's used for searching? It could be used for searching. The thing is, is that when you have um, a row in a database, if you're familiar with, you know, relational, and if you want to add more to it than just what it says, 
you have the ability with object stores to add in those tags to describe a little bit more about that data. And are you, you must, you, I think you said that you're required, uh, the user is required, the data, data owner is required to uh, format the data somehow. So that's a great question, and I'll get to the slides, but in essence, when you put object data into S3, it does not require any format. So the problem with object storage is once you put it in there, whether it was a CSV or a video, if you don't know what it was that you put in, you pull it out, to you it could just be binary data. And so the, the, there's a lot of cataloging services that people use like Dynamo or Elasticsearch around S3 to help identify what you have or put tags in. This is a CSV file. And you put metadata so you describe what it is. Um, you know, so that's, but you think about it, when you have one object, not so bad. Maybe 10,000, but when you have millions, when you have trillions, that can become a nightmare. And then those are some of the drawbacks. Any other questions? Well, so again, I want to thank everyone for having us here. Uh, we are believers in object storage. I know we talked about some of the benefits. As uh, we mentioned that there are benefits, but there are also some drawbacks. At KS Sumo, we are here to address some of those drawbacks. What KS Sumo is, is smart object storage. You know, so what does that mean? What we're doing is we're creating an abstraction layer in our first release around S3, but it could be Azure and their cloud offering or Google or something else that is adding additional capability, abstraction layer to do what we call all three phases of data management with analytics. And so in essence, we're taking that same S3 system that you love and extending the API, extending the UI to do more, which we'll go into it in a second. So real quick, we're a Boston-based company. Um, we have a personnel of 10 people. It's very heavy engineering focus, very heavy CS, computer science focus. We've been building this solution for two years. We have some unique technology called Data Edge Technology that allows us to do what we do within the S3 framework. Um, we have three patents filed. We started beta beginning of this year, and uh, we're going GA with um, a community edition of our service, the data management side of our product, we'll get to in a second, um, this fall. So, you know, we talk about object storage is exploding, but there are some problems with it. Um, the inability to know what you have in your bucket is a big problem. So there was a whole movement, get your data into the cloud, get into the cloud, get into object storage. Now the problem is, what's in my buckets? So we have so much data now into object storage, and there's no good way to discover what you have. You don't know what structure it is. You don't know um, whether it's social security numbers or credit card numbers, or if it's public or private. There's a lot of problems when you when you put it into an unstructured world. Um, and there's another mantra, store everything in the cloud. Because the hope is, the hope is that you figure out value in the future, right? Big data value. But a lot of times these, this future um, has problems. So what we've done is we have built a concept called Smart Object Storage. It looks and feels like S3. It essence is S3. But we built in discovery features, data management features, um, refining the ability to model and structure your unstructured data to ultimately query directly on S3. So it, that, that get list that, you, that data show you, imagine if you could organize it and say, get me something very specific in that data without having to do it generically from a key perspective. Um, we allow you to normalize, aggregate, and correlate your data sets. Again, that's a unique capability that classically you think of ETL, if anyone was familiar with ETL, extract, transfer, um, transform, load. That's very time consuming, costly, lots of data engineering, the architects get involved. Where what if you do it in place with a click of a mouse? Um, and with our unique technology, we can do that. Um, we have a concept called audit grouping to be able to organize, put policies and roles on that data that is so important to you. As well as a new concept we call virtual buckets, the ability to take all these data sources create a virtual bucket that can be queried both text and relational search. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to throw in some machine learning verbiage, but we'll automate the process. Uh, we have some machine learning in our product now. Um, and what smart object storage leads into is intelligent data lakes. So, you know, data lakes, if folks are familiar with it, we've talked about it a little bit. 
data lakes is a concept that you don't structure your data up front, you figure out value later. And so there's a concept that dump everything into um, object storage per se and uh, you know do the the if, if you will the ETLing after the structuring afterwards. But the problem with this um, is that data lake can become data swamps very easily because it becomes unwieldy. And you think about it, if you have a million objects of all different types, did you remember what you put in there? Right? Um, and so companies like Hadoop, I'm sure everyone's heard of Hadoop, Hadoop is a classic processing engine to manage a data lake concept. You know, um, and then, so I'm sure you guys all know, but Hadoop, a lot of the Hadoop's problems is that complexity of figuring out later. The other thing is a lot of the technology of Hadoop now is you're structuring it anyway. So even a data lake um, is getting more structured just because it's hard to process after the fact. So you know what we're doing is we're introducing both data management, data modeling aspects, all within that construct. You don't have to use CPU to build out ETL um, or move your data into higher level servers or more complicated services. So again, you know this is what KSUMO is about. I don't want to make this a tire um, pitch on um, KSUMO, but if you need management for object storage or analytics and not having to move your data, KSUMO is a great service. Um, that we're coming out this fall in the GA. But if you're looking for beta uh, testing, we're also looking for design partners. If anybody is interested in giving us feedback on what we're doing, um, we'd love to, to talk to you. But we believe in object storage. We believe that it's taking off. Um, but it does have some limitations in its complexity, as well as data movement issues. And that's I mean, so. So just real quick, this is the classic architecture. Someone asked me the before and after. This is what a classic Amazon architecture would look like um, to building out a analytics system within object storage, and we collapse all those features into one service uh, for you. So, um, you know, with that said, again, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but uh, you know, we are doing something unique in the, in the space and coming out this fall in a uh, community edition. Please check it out. Any questions on, on that? So what's your target clients? Yeah, so we have um, you know, key personas. Um, we're really focusing on the business analysts and data scientists because we want a self-service, simple um, experience because if you think about it, data scientists call the data engineers to do their work for IT departments. We want the business analysts and data scientists to be able to go to the S3, click, drag, drop to do their analysis on their data. Um, Data engineers could still use their service because they're going to call it up and say, how do I do X? How do I do Y? Time to results. Uh, so data engineers are also a part of it. And then it's a platform. It's, a, it's We're turning S3 into an application framework. So there's aspects of developers using our system. Uh, we are focused on the first phase of our product in the fall, data management as a free service. But really the enterprise, the analytics side of it is where we're really going after. And that's really the full stack for data scientists and, and BI people to play with it. So, 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 would it be fair to say that in the statement, what you're doing is giving visibility, visibility and structure into, into their data stores? A absolutely. You know, some people say it's, we're turning S3 into hot searchable storage or we're structuring S3. Absolutely. With some data management aspects that right, can be right. current. But you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Now, if you have a follow up question, so you, you got Amazon, you got Zur, you got Yeah. So Amazon uses S3 for object storage. Yeah. If I'm storing my data like that, Amazon, do I have any option other than S3 and object, object storage? Or is that just, if I'm on Amazon, I'm on S3. If I'm on Azure, I'm on their version of object storage. That, that, that's true, but you, they, have, they, they have other storage platforms, like classic file systems. You can store into a relational database or a NoSQL database like Dynamo. Even on, it, on Amazon. It's Amazon. Amazon. They have a variety of ways, but the problem is the cost just jumps. Right. So if you're using like Redshift and you have a petabyte of data in S3 and a petabyte of data of Redshift, woof. And so it, it, it costs a lot of so money. It's specific to the so yeah. specific to those specific type of stores that, that Amazon's got you have a choice of Right. And so so our premise is that if you have a petabyte of data that's unmanaged, you manage it through us and then if you have to move a few, you know, bytes to say Spark for analytics or register for last search, move that data. But keep it all within S3 for the, all the heavy lifting, the, all the ETLing. We call it virtual ETLing because um, again we, we don't we're not gonna do a demo here, but uh, um, you know, check check out KSUMO. There are videos online of our service. Um, and again, if you do have needs like this, we're looking for design partners to give us feedback on what we're doing, um, and really come up with a feature set that, that meets people's needs.
So um, that's it. I'm, I'm glad that uh, Hope We Made of Believers and Object Storage, it is happening. I promise you that uh, Object Storage is, uh, is changing things. And uh, you know, as we talk to analysts um, out there, they, they agree um, there's something going on. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be new problems because of it. Um, yeah, so it's probably going to help solve it. But, um, you know, I, I do appreciate you having us in. And, uh, you know, thank you. Yeah.